We're very lucky to have Ellen, as you saw on the catalog, her qualifications are amazing. Archaeology is one of my favorite things in the whole world, and you're going to learn exciting things about the area we live in, too. So we are very fortunate you came all the way down, and we are very appreciative. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, let's Thank rock. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, I want to say happy National Native American Heritage Month, which is celebrated every November all over the country. Uh, October is actually Massachusetts Archaeology Month. And yeah, it's celebrated every October. It's the 25th year, I believe. Um, I've been a practicing professional archaeologist for 34 years now in Massachusetts. Uh, prior to my gig at the state, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, where I manage uh, half a million acres, I was the Boston City archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I worked on all of the big, big campaigns. For any of you who remember the big thing, it's ancient history now, but um, it, a lot of wonderful data came out of that. Hey, is it all right to turn the lights out? Um, there we go. So I. You know, I was wondering what to do uh, in presenting to you today, and I said, oh, I could just focus on Fall River, but it hasn't always been Fall River. We don't know what this place was called thousands of years ago, and people have been here for thousands and thousands of years. So I thought I'd start at the very beginning, and I'd just give you a little summary of, of what we do know about this area. Um, I, at DCR, I'm a sister agency to the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and that's where the State Historic Preservation Officer, Executive Director, and State Archaeologists work out of. So I work for the State Archaeologists, and they keep a database of all known historic period sites and pre-contact or indigenous Native American sites. Native American sites, that database is we are exempt from the Freedom of Information Law. We do not have to share that information because it's sensitive. And we have had grave robbers in the past. We've had people, we still have people that go out there and try to pilfer sites. And you can still go on eBay and see some of these uh, ancient artifacts for sale. So um, it's a big focus of mine to sort of get away from that object-oriented, treasure-seeking mentality. And I think there was actually something just on TV about some secret treasure hunt in Boston where they, I, I'm not even actually going to go there, but um, so I focus on the science and um, unfortunately we don't know a lot about uh, the sites around here. Most of them were actually excavated or collected by avocational archaeologists back in the 1800s, early 1900s, and actually some good archaeology came out of Massachusetts Archaeological Society um, members who were digging around in the sites. Um, there's a lot we need to learn, uh, but this whole area is highly sensitive for prehistoric resources. So, and I put this in, the network of rivers that connect the coast to ponds and wetlands in the near interior provided access to resources, trade, and communication for indigenous groups across the entire Taunton River drainage. The rivers were their highways. They m could move everywhere with their machines. And um, although we haven't found any seafaring vessels, some up to 35, 40 feet in length, um, no doubt they had them. Should we all in? Yes. BP. Oh, oh, I could use before Common Era BCE. It's sort of a separation of the religious. Um, BP, actually, it's a good question. Uh, is 1950, um, and that was the date that radiocarbon was discovered. So everything is based on the radiocarbon dating. Um, you sometimes see BCE, Before Common Era, which is another way, but I use BP because we often use radiocarbon dating. Thank you. Sure. So, um, everything, the people of New England had everything to do with the environment. Uh, between 18,000 and 14,000 years ago, we had a sheet of ice that was upwards of two miles thick right here. And the force of that glacier, during its retreat to the north, contoured and sculpted the environment, the topography that we have now out there. 
It created some of the deep river drainages. And it created, it left a tundra-like environment. And shortly thereafter, um, our friends, the woolly mammoth, started coming in. This is a baby, a real baby woolly mammoth too. It's a baby. The, the adult ones um, were about the size of a drum, small drum. So that's a, that's a woolly mammoth um, too. Uh, and we do know they came into the area because we... Uh, fishermen still pull them up in their nets out on Georgia's Bay. They find uh, tusks and they find teeth. We haven't found a fully articulated one here in New England, but in New York, uh, and, uh, about, I guess, 15 years ago, they found a fully articulated one in a kettle hole, a glacial pond. Um, they were pretty stupid animals. Um, they, uh, <laughs> they are, well, they are cousin of the elephant. They were vegetarians. And they would often go to these uh, uh, kettle ponds and eat the grass and then stumble in and drown. Um, and they didn't start dating until they were about 35. So that has a lot to do with why they're extinct. So, um, and soon after, the megafauna, including the giant bear, the caribou, uh, a giant beaver, 300 pound beaver, um, these people came up from the south. We don't know what they called each other. Archaeologists have assigned them the name Paleo for ancient. Uh, but they had names, they spoke, they communicated. And again, they traveled in small groups and they had base camps. And there's one actually that was very close to this location in Middleborough. And um, they came in uh, thousands of years ago. And we know they were here because they left stuff. Now, I love stuff, and I use the term stuff. Uh, it's not being disrespectful to these people. It's just um, to have you begin to understand how an archaeologist thinks. Um, when uh, these people, not necessarily these people, but indigenous people are still here today. And it's not, uh, the story's untold. It's not represented uh, as equally as the historic periods. Um, but archaeologists study the things that people left behind to try to put together uh, an idea of what daily life was like for them. These people didn't have stores. They provided, they lived off the land. They utilized all the resources that were available to them, including the amazing volcanics in this area that go back uh, 600 million years. But the first people that came up brought exotic materials. This is actually probably about 10,000 years old. It's broken on one end, um, and that was recent uh, when it was located in Foxborough. But this is a, a Pennsylvania, this is a chert, a very specialized stone. And when it comes around, run your fingers <coughs> on it. Don't cut yourself, you could easily cut yourself. I actually had an uh, event last Saturday, and, and I still have carrots left over. Um, I had the kids peeling carrots with it. Um, it's very sharp. How do you spell that? C-H-E-R-T. Uh, what is that? What's a chert? It's a rock. It's a volcanic rock. A volcanic rock. Yeah, and the it only comes, archaeologists love rocks because they can be sourced. They only come from certain parts of the world. This one here came from a specific area in Pennsylvania. So the very first people that came into the area were bringing these exotic materials that were um, had qualities that made them really uh, exceptional for making blades and stone tools. Up here we have a lot of volcanic, we have quartz, which is a cryptocrystalline, and if you hit it to try to strike it and make a stone tool, it fractures in different ways. You really don't have control over the stone. Whereas with this chert, you do. And I wish I had a, a, a light underneath you could put it. There's a clear vein. It's almost like a crystal quartz right through it. And that really defines exactly where it came from, which rock outcrop it came from. So um, we love rocks because, again, we can source them. And this style, this shape of the blade is defined we have a, I call this the Bible, the New England Typology. You can buy this online from the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Oh, awesome. So can I see that, please? Let me see if I can. 
Oh, there it is. Can you see it? See that right there? It's a vein. I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. There you go. You can use that. Um, and actually, when you take a look at it, it's worked on both sides. It's called the biface. That was down. That was about a foot and a half down. But and that's a good question. Um, we uh, want to know. Archaeologists want to know where we are in three-dimensional space. So we keep track of where we dig. We know where we are on a USGS topographic map. We measure exactly. Uh, we're constantly um, taking measurements to establish exactly where we are uh, in the stratigraphy and how far down we are and what the associations are, what we're finding it with, the artifacts with, and what the soil is. So this was found in a, a B horizon and it was the only thing that was found. So it appears that it was may have been dropped accidentally. We, we're not for sure. That is um, part of the fancy lingo for stratigraphy. Um, when we excavate, um, there's usually a topsoil, a very dark organic topsoil that's comprised of dead leaves. And, um, and then we come down to a sand. Uh, and below that is a glacial deposited sand that's usually sterile. So I just use that as a way to identify um, the level it's in. You can associate, you can say level one, level two, level three. Um, so just so, so you know where you are again in three-dimensional space. So we don't know much about these people. We rarely find uh, points like this unless they're associated with sites. Uh, these people, again, they traveled in small bands, uh, family groups, and um, they, when the megafauna moved up to the north, they soon followed. So um, coming up again, the next group of people, it's a, it's a wide range, it's 6,000 years, and it's actually broken up into three different periods, but I'm gonna, for the sake of um, this presentation, just uh, describe what was happening. Now I mentioned um, the environment has everything to do with the peopling. Well, the climate was getting warmer, that glacier, was retreating to the north. The glacier was melting, the air is getting warmer, and we start getting a new environment. We start getting a deciduous forest. We start getting beech and alder and oak. Oak starts dropping acorns, and these are, trees are providing food waste for new animals that are coming into the area um, because of this climate change. I know people talk about climate change, and I'm like, it's been going on for like hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and these people were aware of it. They were living off the land. They knew um, seasonally probably what day of the year it was based on um, their surroundings, um, the tree growth, plant growth, uh, and maritime life. So when I describe the archaic period, it's a completely different environment. It's much warmer. The sea level is rising progressively, the climate's rising progressively, and they are, uh, you start seeing new species. You start seeing deer, and you start seeing turkey thriving off the acorns. You start seeing um, the sea level flooding the major rivers. So you start getting anadromous fish who are going upstream um, in the spring, and catadromous, you start seeing eels that are coming down to spawn in the ocean. So with these new, with these changes, you start seeing a lot of different new technologies. And you start seeing um, very blatant ideology. Um, and this is a uh, feature. Uh, it is a site that's two meters by one meter. And it was found. Um, in Quincy, and it's the only kind of this site anywhere. And <coughs> I'm going to go into a little detail <coughs> on that later. Um, but we were able to save the whole site, excavate it, and interpret it. And it appears to be associated with whaling. And I see you folks are associated with whaling. This is great because I was just gifted 
um, sperm whale oil. And I have an original can I'd like to donate to your museum. Wow. Yeah, you can't sell it. No. Um, but so I have it in the original can. Okay, yeah. So and so this is a whale tail weight, an atlatl weight, and I actually my atlatls are in the car. Um, I could bring them in if you want to see them. We could have a little competition outside if you want to stay. Um, and I'll show you uh, the purpose of them. But I'm going to send this around. This is a stone in the shape of a whale tail. And this would have been attached to a spear uh, to propel it, to give it more weight uh, for pounds per square inch on hunting some of those larger animals. This is a fish weir. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Again, the sea levels were rising. Um, we see a lot of activity flooding into the larger rivers, including the Taunton River. And we see them start constructing these fish weirs. Excuse me, one yeah. question. That uh, site in Quincy, is that protected now? Yeah, no, it's been completely excavated. And the artifacts are at the Mass Historical Commission, and we're working with the Massachusetts tribe and the mayor of Quincy to try to get them back here to interpret them um, for the public. So yeah, Quincy is very dedicated. They just hired a heritage management specialist and they're giving the first people the full court press in their uh, history. It's amazing. Oh, so I'm still going in the wrong direction. So I mentioned um, the Adelaide. And we did, we had this, I had a gigantic um, woolly mammoth target uh, on Saturday. And this was one technology that enabled the first people to... The last slide you showed 9,000 to 3,000 years ago. Oh. So are they still hunter-gatherers or when does agriculture come to the new world? That comes in in uh, the woodland period. They were towards the late archaic um, starting um, a little bit of horticulture. Um, they were land managers. Um, they were landscapers, massive landscapers, and they created a park-like landscape um, at that time. So we start seeing other plants coming in, which I'll talk about, but the full agriculture was uh, in the woodland period. So yeah, very, very close, sort of on that border. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. So. Um, again, uh, the technology, this was uh, sort of on the idea of a chuck it. If you have a dog with one of those extended plastic handles and a, a little thing for the ball, um, the trajectory is like tripled, but um, the, the square, uh, pounds per square inch is uh, approximately 600 pounds, so it would be very prudent for um, hunting. Now, we're still in... Um, the archaic period, one of the technologies that came about was ground stone artifacts. Now that Pennsylvania artifact that I sent around, uh, that blade, is actually uh, from striking, from lithic technology, from actually hitting another stone or a caribou antler against it to create those sharp edges. And it's worked on both sides to create somewhat of an aerodynamic uh, tool. Ground stone artifacts are abraded and I'll start this here with you and they're carefully um, ground with another stone in water and if you feel like it, you can do this at home with a ri river rock you can um, begin to abrade uh, a stone and you'll see that it actually files down very nicely and you can create a really sharp edge um, here's a Another one. Now, the the wood is not this. The wood is not historic. Um, these were added after the fact. One thing I do want to point out is that um, your organic materials, your wood, your leather, your hair, uh, your plant materials, do not survive in the archaeological record here in New England because of the acidity of the soil. So oftentimes we're only left with stone tools. And I make this point, stone tools represent only 5% of their stuff. So think about 5% of your stuff. 
and trying to tell a story about you from the 5% of your material culture. It's very difficult to do. So we rely on oral histories a lot. I use actually Victorian uh, histories to go back even to the 1700s and 1800s to find out what people living then knew about those first people that were there in their communities. So um, I just passed around a net weight here and then that is a, a probably a boat making tool in the second row. This one here? Probably used, yeah. Um, and that is a uh, axe up front. Oh, I am sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. So um, I'm going to talk about the language a little later, but I just wanted to again bring it up that these people were uh, had obviously had language. We know that. Uh, again, they were carving into trees called dendroglyphs, um, probably creating symbols and signs on other materials that just don't survive. So this was actually the first language uh, with no living speakers to be revived. And Jesse, Jesse Dobert uh, is responsible for it. And it's a program that came out of MIT. And her daughter, her 13-year-old daughter, actually speaks fluid. Uh, Algonquin. Oh, wow. And I bring this up, this is a Living with Whales, a wonderful recent book, but you can actually um, see how very, very specific um, the language is. And I just wanted to read this one passage. Uh, Edward Sapir once said, Algonquin words are like tiny images poems. Because of their context-dependent nature, Algonquin words often are, like the images poems they resemble, uncompromisingly concrete, pointing directly to the heart of each reference being. being. So, um, it's a, and I can't speak it, uh, but if you ever get a chance to hear it, and I know you can go down to the Mashantucket Pequot Museum in Connecticut, and there's a uh, interactive display where you can listen to the different yeah. dialects. You've been there? Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh. This wasn't a written language. No. Um, it, it was written, uh, John Elliott saved it. And uh, he came in. He took the phonetics and then transcribed it. Exactly. <coughs> no, no. And Roger Williams again, you can see, I think this is uh, some of the words that uh, came out of um, his translations. But no, John Elliott is attributed with saving their language. Absolutely. So, I mentioned the fish weir, uh, and actually one is built on the original shoreline, Child Street, in Boston, every May with Ross Miller, the artist, and the Wampanoag uh, singers and dancers. And this was delivered to me uh, when I was a Boston City archaeologist. It was uh, picked up by a young, young lawyer in the 1930s when work was being done on the Childs River. And it was right when the Boylston Street fish weirs were being discovered. These are the wooden-like fences that were established in the estuaries along the riverways where the sea would meet the river. Um, and the estuaries were like their whole foods for the first people. Um, they acted like um, oyster um, uh, projects, and they trapped fish. And twice a day, when the larger fish would chase the bait fish in, the bait fish would swim over the fence, and then with the outgoing tide, get stuck. Historic fish weirs have recorded upwards of 100,000 fish being taken in a two-tide cycle. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was a it was a smart way to fish, and then you just get Grandma and little Billy in their baskets and say, "Get out there before the birds." I imagine that it must have driven the birds crazy. All right, I'm not sure if this is going to be able to work, but this, um, I'm dedicated to uh, bringing the indigenous voice into uh, interpretation and art uh, with the state. And I hired Robert Peters to draw this version of a fish weir, and this can be found on public signage on the Neponset River in the New Park. So, um, but I don't know if this is going to. I can try it. Can you try it? Yeah. 
<laughs> That'd be great. Oh. That's it. So now you just... Oh, there we go. Okay. So it's... Here we go, Charles River. Fish weirs. See that? Oh, here come the fish. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so these the fish in the boat. Um, so these were excavated uh, back in the 30s. Um, and they were located along Boylston Street. And actually at one of the stations you can uh, go down into the Boylston Street subway and you can actually see a version of them. And um, it's pretty exciting if you go in, oh, there you go. There's the subway going in. And that's when they found the fish weirs. But uh, they're wooden, wood pieces of wooden steak. Yes, because, and actually, because they were submerged, they were in an anaerobic environment, no oxygen, saturated with water, um, they were beautifully preserved. Um, oh, the, um, I, was, I was telling you about the fish sticks that I was presented with in the mason jar. Um, this gentleman knew the importance of these fish weirs, and he saved those samples, and you can actually see the kink in a couple of the pieces where the pressure from the sea level rise um, forced them uh, to sort of crunch down. Um, these became, these Boylston Street fish weirs along the Charles River became obsolete by 3,500 years ago because that's when the sea level stabilized. That's when the beaches you know out here stabilized, so they were no longer useful. Yes, sir? Now, I know Boston is probably a little unusual because there's so much of it has been filled in. But generally along the East Coast, I assume it's not like Europe where you have to go down dozens of feet because you've got... How far down generally do you have to go in the, in the East Coast before you actually get to the land that the Native Americans stood on? That was 35 feet 35 below feet. surface. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it, it depends on where you are. If you're on a floodplain, it makes a difference. Um, in the, during the big dig, uh, in the north end, do you folks remember when you were able to walk underneath the elevated highway through a tunnel in the north end? There was always a guy there playing a saxophone when you went to get your cannolis. Uh, we took that pavement up, and right below it was the 17th century because they had gone in, and in preparation for building the elevated highway in the 1950s, they completely uh, truncated, moved everything, and put sterile sand down. So when we came back in the 1990s, we pulled up the asphalt, and we came right down upon one of the piers associated with the mill pond that was there before the Bullfriends Triangle, um, so where the North End is now. So. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It depends on where you are, uh, how far down you have to go. Would you explain why the stabilization of uh, the tide movements obsoleted the fish weirs? Sure. Um, because with the rising sea levels, um, it started the fish weirs that we've, been date we've dated it to 5300 before present. And it was only utilized until 3,500 before present. So it was a, just a window of period time when the sea levels were rising enough uh, for the height of the fish weir to be used. The fish weir in the Boylston Street in, on uh, the Charles River was used continuously for, 50, for over 1,500 years. It was reconditioned annually. They would go out and reaffix stakes, wooden stakes, um, and it, uh, when the sea level finally stabilized, it was much higher. Oh, too high for it to be effective. It's for it to be effective. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So can I go right back to the? Okay. Okay. So uh, another technology, bow technology, um, machines. That's what they call the machines. 
Um, at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, you'll see one that's 40 feet long. We, we haven't found a seafaring vessel in New England um, yet, but I will tell you, with one of the latest um, fields of archaeology is uh, emergency or disaster archaeology, and FEMA is sending out archaeologists when these tornadoes come through or hurricanes come through. Florida has uncovered a number of these indigenous wooden vessels. They're below water. They're perfectly preserved. This one is at Lake Quinsigamon. We have about seven or eight machines that are submerged. It was very common um, during the archaic period and the woodland period for uh, the people to submerge them in the late fall and to prevent protect them from freeze and thaw in New England. And they would put boulders in them to keep them down. And then in the spring, they would dive down, take the boulders out, bring them back up. These weigh, can you imagine a saturated tree, how much they weigh? Um, the Nipmuc uh, annually, actually right around now, do a uh, machine run down the Mystic Charles River, Mystic River, I'm sorry, uh, to reenact uh, when they were barged from their villages out to Deer Island. Uh, and they used to use real machines, but every time they swamped, they just couldn't get them over. So now they use regular canoes, but they, they are just something else. Um, on your far left, uh, they actually did a, a, a recreation and they uh, beat the ferry down to Martha's Vineyard in a race. <laughs> But you can see they would start a fire at actually the bottom, the tree would come over, uh, then they'd start a fire inside and, and dig it out. So, oh yeah, so you, those have been going around. Uh, you know what, I'll be able to share um, a lot of these. You can come up and see the rest of the artifacts. Uh, whaling, I mentioned whaling. Um, that uh, site that I mentioned in Quincy, it's called the Caddy Park site, and it's right there. Uh, on the ocean, and it's a, a beautiful, on Black's Creek, it's a, a knoll um, that's surrounded by this beautiful estuary, and uh, it was located in 1999, um, and these are some of the uh, artifacts. These are actually flensing tools <coughs> for uh, carving blubber. They're extremely uh, thin and durable. We also found, this is actually a whale tail, uh, wait here. This was a whale tail pendant that this was the only broken artifact in the whole assemblage of 234 artifacts. And these are some of the net weights, uh, just like the one I passed around. Um, and we had some boat uh, working tools. So this is a depiction, a planned drawing. Um, this red that you see is hematite. It's a mineral um, from the area. And it's also known as red ochre, and it's often used in spiritual um, rituals, um, painting. And this whole uh, feature was covered with this hematite. On top of that, we had uh, what would we suspect was a net a vegetal net, but the, vet, the net did not survive because of the acidity. And we think there was a net there because it was surrounded by, I think, eight net weights, almost as if they had placed, after creating this, had placed the net with the net weights on it. And we had a number of different caches, including the flensing knives, um, boat polishing kits, and um, other artifacts. It, pretty amazing, pretty amazing sight. So, why, why do you think they were, this was put there? Well, you know, a number of uh, thoughts. One was it was a cenotaph, that it was, it was created for someone who died. Uh, we didn't find any remains. We didn't find any bones at all, which we suspected we might with the hematite, the red ochre. It's often a sign with burials. So we think it may have been an offering to someone important in the tribe, especially with uh, the broken pendant, the only broken artifact. I, I asked Ren Green, uh, Ren, what do, you, what do you think? And she automatically said, oh, it was broken to confirm, you know, the, uh, affirm the death of somebody, and that was the end, and so that was common in their heritage. Um, 
and the whale tail, all of these associations with whales. You can actually see a little blowhole here, a mouth. And I always like to give this fun fact. One whale equals 236 deer. So it would have been completely um, uh, satisfying to you know, be able to process a, a whale and feed it. Um, we also think that it may have been, it was, could have been a cenotaph, could have been an offering to the uh, god, uh, Maushap, uh, the um, benevolent um, uh, god of whaling, who would bring whales uh, to the shoreline for the people. He's also known for having created Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard with his foot. Um, so we're not sure. We also thought, oh, do you think maybe it was put there in expecting to go back? But there was too much care. It was down below about, it probably would have been about two or three feet at the time. And there was too much care giving to, to this, the creating of these artifacts. None of them were used. There was no sign of use on all of them except for the pendant. And just careful preparation. So um, we, we don't know. But yes? Now, were all the boats manpower, or did, did the Native Americans ever invent sailing? You know, it's a good question. You know, I'm sure they did for purposes of collecting water. Um, they, they attribute that to the Vikings um, and actually really need information. They found, they think they found Ramachurk down at Coles Hill in Plymouth, uh, which is usually only associated with the sites up north, the Viking sites. But they just found bison hair in uh, Viking sails, which is an indicator of the um, trading with the Inuit over here. So it's, um, I can't answer your question. I, I think, I'm not a maritime archaeologist, but I think the Vikings were, but you know, if, if I were to be in a, 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 a machoon and I got caught in a squall, I'd hang up a sheet if I had one, <laughs> try to get me to move somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, they were hugging the coast. They were uh, with some of these machines, and they were doing long distance seafare. And if, if they were, in fact, whaling, um, they'd have to have you know some type of control. They had oars historically. I know uh, if you go to some of the court records back in the 1600s, the Native Americans had to teach the English how to manage these canoes because you steered with your you were on your knees um, when you were paddling, and a lot of drownings occurred because the English couldn't maneuver a machine. Yes. But to sail, you need to have a keel, and the machines look like they were truly a lot. Um, see, this is where you lose me. Yeah, I don't know anything about sailing. So, um, I, but I do know that the, um, yeah, the Vikings had the, the bison hair things, but does anybody know any about sails? Ordinarily, they're uh, woven fabric. So the question would be, could they have had a large enough, thin enough oh. skin to or hold? fabric. Yeah. So well, all of their yep. fabric, and this is another thing, I'm glad you brought it up, Dave. Uh, their fabric was vegetal. They would, um, and I saw a beautiful example yesterday when I was down working with um, my friend Linda Coombs. Uh, she made a, it was a cat, cat and eye tail mat. And that was selected purposely because of its water repellent qualities. And she had made this actual map, mat, which they would use in their um, WeTus. And they would also use them for their roofing material because it was waterproof and it also kept the bugs out. Um, so yes, yeah, certain um, types of vegetation are known for a great weaving. They were wonderful weavers and the reason we know this is because, well, when I get to the um, pottery uh, section, they would oftentimes roll the clay, which they dug up, uh, onto their material. And you would get the impression of the wharf and the, um, it, what is it, the weft and the wharf? Any knitters here? Or? Okay. Um, so we get the impression of the actual weaving technology, which is amazing. But yes, they would have produced larger um, pieces, and uh, yeah, I'm sure deer skin would get quite, quite thin. So, um, good question. Oh, you know what? I, I'll have to ask my indigenous friends. 
They're the experts. So, and I, I'm, I'll, we'll, we can take a break after, after this, but these are some close-ups, and you can actually see the red ochre, uh, the staining of these artifacts, and these actually uh, were broken, those stone tools were actually broken uh, during the excavation, so. And then the top uh, are those uh, net weights that would have held the net down. Hey, so I'm going to come around. What time do we have? Okay, should I just keep going? Yeah. Okay. So I you know, wanted to come around uh, here to your <coughs> neck of the woods. And again, right on the Taunton River. And um, the, this is a reproduction uh, of the right of the carvings in on Dighton Rock, done by John Danforth in 1680, and he was commissioned by the Royal Society over in London. Uh, they were locating curiosities in the New World, and this was a huge one. Uh, Dighton Rock. Um, George Washington came here and he looked at it and he said, absolutely, this was done by the indigenous people. It's just like the stuff we have down in Virginia. So nobody listened to him. Nobody listened to George. Um, they're still fighting over, you know, who carved this. Um, so one thing we did recently. Oh, and, the, and I, I bring these up because uh, uh, the Taunton River has been the focus of archaeology. And this is Grassy Island. This was another undertaking excavated um, by a psychologist out of Brown University who was obsessed with Dighton Rock. And he was, one, he was a psychologist. He was one of the first psychologists to actually uh, use the Rorschach, develop the Rorschach test. Um, he actually purchased Grassy Island. He purchased this property here. Um, he was an experimental type of doctor. I guess he smoked a lot of hashish. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was some sort of therapy back then. Um, so, but I do credit him with protecting and saving uh, the stone. I put a, a historic map here just showing the watershed um, and sh showing the limits of the Taunton watershed up here. Uh, I think it's what, 500 and yeah, 526 square miles. And again, these were the highways for these first people. They were all over the place. So um, this place, in addition to what I just mentioned, has a lot of other characteristics that just, I mean, if I had to say, if you asked me, Ellen, if during the archaic period, where would you want to live? Um, I'd have to say either Boston Harbor or Taunton because of the resources that were there, the fresh resources, the estuaries. Um, this would have been used by the Narragansett, the Massachusetts. It would have been an ideal location for sacred ritual sites. You would have had the uh, uh, anadromous fish coming up during the spring. Um, you would have had plenty of uh, hunting and gathering, and it's just the perfect place uh, for this type of a uh, culture. Here's an aerial, again showing Grassy Island at high tide and low tide. And the excavations that um, this gentleman uh, took, he, uh, Delabar, he was the one that determined that the fish weirs were associated with that time period because of the archaeology he did on Grassy Island, he knew that the shoreline had been much lower uh, for some of these sites that he excavated because they were submerged. So he, here's a psychologist who's smoking who knows what, is contributing to the field of archaeology in ways we you know, just couldn't fathom. But um, you can actually purchase these or go on uh, to the Bridgewater State uh, library system and all the MAS, Massachusetts Archaeological Society bulletins are there um, for your reading and you can read, actually read about these. This was the RSYP <laughs> Museum in Andover that oversaw this uh, production of Grassy Island as well. 
Um, a friend of mine, Steve Wilkes, uh, from uh, Harry Feldman and Associates, they're the oldest land surveying company in Boston, uh, offered to do 3D uh, laser uh, scanning of the rock. And this is the low resolution. The high resolution was, was um, uh, not as clear. It's all based on uh, reflection um, and resolution. So, but you can see this image here is sort of a Frankenstein looking character. And it is actually, when I blew this up, he's holding two Thunderbirds in his hands. Um, and again, a symbol uh, in indigenous culture. We have two caribous. You can actually see one here uh, with the horns. There's a male over here, and there's a baby between them. And these two characters, these ghost-like images, are supposed to represent um, spirits. Uh, and they're actually sitting on the deer back. And this um, I think it was enhanced by some of the people promoting the Portuguese, the Templar interpretation. We uh, studied it further, is the actual uterus of the female deer or caribou. So uh, procreation, um, we have mountains up here. Uh, you can see some modern graffiti. But this is supposed to, uh, we're believed to represent wee tucks. And Ed Lennick is a stone uh, expert uh, on these pictographs, and um, that's pretty much what he came uh, to the conclusion. So I've engaged the local indigenous community to see if it speaks to them. Um, it was actually moved, oops, it was moved in 1963, and um, it is protected in a really, well, how many of you have been there? like a really cheesy Mediterranean style uh, museum with Portuguese pillars and sailing vessels. And, and so we're going to try to bring it up to um, give it another interpretation, uh, try to eliminate the Phoenicians and the Vikings and all those other people. And um, how many of you know this is the Massachusetts State Rock? Yeah. What about everyone? <clears throat> oh, it's you know what it's a, I think it's like a sand a sandstone. I'm, yeah, I have it written down somewhere, but it's it's that's about 13 feet across. But yeah, whenever I ask the kids, what's the state rock of Massachusetts? They're like Plymouth Rock, and I'm like, nope. So, um, so if you haven't gone, there's a very strong friends group, and they're actually really wonderful. Dighton Rock. It's in Berkeley, Mass. So the next group. Uh, next time period is what we call the woodland period. And um, again, the shoreline has stabilized, the sea level has stabilized, uh, people, people stabilize, people can settle down now. They don't have to worry about sea level rise, climate change for another couple of hundred years. <laughs> um, so they begin to exploit all the maritime resources. Uh, we have new fish, new animals. We have um, all sorts of shellfish. Um, and again, the typologies of the stone tools are changing, adjusting to uh, the different species, the different types of animals and fish and reptiles. Uh, and we start seeing the production of ceramics, which sort of coincide with uh, the horticulture, agriculture. Um, with the growth of maize, uh, the cultivation of maize, you need a, a sturdier pot for boiling uh, those hard kernels. So um, they started making these clay pots. And you can see little inclusions, these little white marks. Um, to make the pot stronger, they would grind up rock and shells. If they broke a pot, they'd include the pot into the, the new pot and they would fire them to make them waterproof. They would line them with some sort of bear fat. Um, so we, we're lucky when we find it. Some of them are actually beautiful pots. Um, 
I'm a trustee at the Mass Archaeological Society in Middleborough, and if you guys want to do a field trip, we're open on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and there are some gorgeous vessels. Prior to the clay technology, it would have been um, the steatite or soapstone, so which couldn't uh, support the processing of the boiling of the corn. So we have horticulture, we have marine resources, we have um, the ceramic technology, and we have shell middens, M-I-D-D-E-N-S. Now shell middens can be found intercoastal, you know, with your river shellfish. They're just piles of shells from, usually produced from indigenous people, or, um, and the ones inland were actually all recycled for the liming industry in the 18 and 1900s, so we don't, um, get to excavate those as much as the ones on the coast. So um, this was a shell midden we excavated back in the 90s, and um, it, we excavated 100 one by one meter t test pits. So that's how big the shell midden was. And again, this shell midden was used for close to 1,500 years. So a shell midden is like a trash pit. Um, they didn't have garbage collecting back then. So they would have their clam bags, they'd collect their clams, <coughs> excuse me, and they would throw the remains just adjacent, usually adjacent, to um, the shell beds. So we locate them uh, on the southeast coast normally, and thank the Lord that's downwind from their usual sites because we, they knew which way the winds would blow um, during this season because you would not want to be near one of those trash pits uh, on a hot summer day. This one was used um, in the fall. And archaeologists love them because uh, there is a, the alkalinity balances, um, neutralizes the soils, and the organic materials survive. So we are able to... This went through all this. How big would something like that be? In the Pacific Northwest, they're the size of football fields. Yeah, they're huge. Up in Maine, huge. This is these are small here, um, and actually this is a close up of one. It's not too clear, but you can see it's just a dense layer. Um, next time you're even walking along the shoreline, uh, in some areas you can actually you can see them, and just the variation in some of the stone tools. And you know I I mentioned this earlier the stone tool type technology. Um, and I have the book if anybody wants to peruse it, but it is, it's the Bible and it shows you all the different types, forms um, of stone tools, ground stone slates, uh, even later on some of the metal uh, points, arrowheads that were made um, after contact. So um, it's an amazing so, and here, an example of the preservation, this is a, a bone bead on top. We never figured out what this was, but it had to have been some type of organic material. And a ground a slate pendant um, uh, exhibiting uh, adornment. Um, so these were all found in the shell midden. Um, we found hickory nuts, burned hickory nuts, mm -hmm. and the palynology uh, which is a core, a soil core, that's taken in the midden and it's used to identify pollen. Um, pollen cores have identifiable coats, outer coats, so they can say, oh, that was a birch tree, or, or that was a weed, or... Um, they did not locate um, the hickory nut uh, on the island. So the hickory nuts were not being grown on the island, so we figured it was like a trail mix they brought over with them um, during there. Yeah, it's just amazing. So, and these are some of the beautiful bone points. These are made out of deer leg bone. You can see they're just beautifully crafted. And they would have been used for spearing, harpooning um, the larger fish. Uh, some of the, the cod were upwards of you know, over 100 pounds, upwards of six feet. Um, and here are simple uh, bow and awls. This was for w working with leather, uh, punctuating something. How did they form these? 
with stones? Um, they would they'd be abraded with something harder. So which, um, would, which would be stone? Stone, yeah, or um, uh, do I have my antler in there? Yeah, sometimes they they use a, an antler or a billet, something harder, and then polishing. I'm sure um, whether it was a stone, sandstone, something abrasive to to get the points. What would they do to determine that it was a deer bone? Um, that's when you get the experts. You get the the um, bioanthropologists, bioarchaeologists um, to come in, and they can identify. I I spoke with Dave Landon. He's a professor at UMass Boston, and I picked something up once, and I just showed it to him. He's like, "That's a juvenile seagull. Um, they they know their um, their bones." Yeah. So again, just like we have this Bible here, they pollen. Uh, cores, they have a, a representative sample they can identify, cross-reference with, and the same with the animals. And bugs, believe it or not, we have um, archaeoentomologists who are experts in bugs. And bugs only hang out in certain environments, like, uh, like pea weevils only hang out uh, with pea, or peat. And carrion beetles hang out with carrion. Um, so this person is an expert in bugs, and I've seen bugs that I've never seen before in like a privy context, not here, but mm -hmm. um, when excavating a privy, and they still have their eyes, their wings, and legs. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So it's th that's the contextual data, the information that you consider when you're excavating. It's not just about the artifacts or the material culture. The, the science comes in too and the palynologist can tell you what season, the seasonality of a deposit in the shell midden, which is why they how they determine not just based on the types of things that they found, uh, but on the uh, palynology, uh, what type of year, uh, what season it was, what have you. And these are some there are some close ups. And you can see this one here on the left is is just beautifully um, decorated with a Cord wrap stick. Or they would have used shells, they would have used all sorts of things. And from this midden, we had 20 species of mammals, fishes, birds, and reptiles. Eighty-four percent cod, flounders, rats, sturgeon, and alewife bluefish. So, and I'm sorry I don't have a scale on this, but does anybody know what what those are? Those fish scales? Uh, their fish is correct. Jaws? No, nope. they are called otoliths. Yes, Otolis. yeah, fish ear bones. Mm. Oh. Who knew fish could? I thought the term deaf as a haddock. Maybe the haddock <laughs> don't have them. <laughs> but they, 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 ear bones. Yeah. So um, wow. these otoliths were identified, and in, in the size of them, um, the expert was just like the the. the the cod had to be six feet in length. Oh my God. So, and some of them upwards of 200 pounds. So, how big are these? Um, these were from a six. No, oh, but are they an inch or? Oh, they're no, they're 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 probably about this big. They're, they're tiny. Yeah. So, and just it, to add more on the ceramic technology, just showing some of the different styles. Um, and again, if you really want to see some. Uh, Pottery. I go down to the either the Mash and Tuckett Museum or the actual um, the MAS in Middleborough because we have some beautiful, beautiful pots. So in horticulture, I shot this down in Brewster, and during the winter, I'm I'm like, wait a minute, whoa, a cactus garden? And sure enough, this was prickly pear, and it was a whole dune of these uh, uh, the cacti. Uh, that survived. So this obviously came up from the American Southwest. So um, in working closely with the, uh, the tribes, um, the indigenous plants, um, we often go to get inventories because they're still used um, by the tribes. But um, yeah, I found this and I thought that it was uh, pretty amazing. So in the contact period, uh, this was an important social and political center. Um, 
the different tribes developed independently of each other. They had, you know, their languages, different dialects. Um, they were multilingual. Uh, and between 1616 and 1619, uh, well, the Commonwealth area, all the way down to the water, um, to Narragansett Bay, actually, was affected by the, um, what they think may have been a possible infectious hepatitis. It didn't uh, jump the bay, uh, which is one of the reasons the Wampanoag um, survived uh, the uh, infections. And actually, they, they, they I don't know, I, I know that in Scotland they were excavating a medieval cemetery and they found anthrax spores, and it was a plague cemetery, and they think that anthrax may have facilitated the movement of the disease across the waters quickly. So, um, but yeah, just it decimated, uh, decimated uh, the tribes. It was, I think, a 30 mile wide swath from Maine down to Narragansett Bay. So, um, so let's see. I had read somewhere that when the white settlers first came, there were entire villages that were empty. That were, yeah. They fo actually found cleared land, but nobody on it. Yeah, um, a lot of, I mean, they, a lot of these people didn't even have time to bury their loved ones. Um, but the early, I think I put this in there, the early uh, trade with, you know, Verrazano, Gosnell, um, they describe uh, just uh, acre upon acre. Oh, is that rain? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> acre upon acre of fertile fields. And again, these people were master landscapers, planters. They rotated the crops. We find evidence of burn levels uh, in archaeological excavations. Um, and they were managed landscapes. And some of those early, early European maps to pretty much depict that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's still, it's a, it's a working, um, they're still working on that uh, to determine what it, what it may have been. Uh, and then, Kidnapping and slavery. Yes. Sorry. This infection was not brought in by the Europeans. No, no, it it was. I'm not a. Yeah, I'm not an expert in this area. Um, but just from the results, like a, a lot of uh, reports are coming up from medical anthropologists, and the CDC uh, is working. They uh, they contacted me because we just finished excavating a smallpox cemetery, and they were very interested in um, retrieving live DNA. So um, they're still they're they're working on a lot of uh, these medical cases that um, don't have you know answers, and I don't think that this one does. I think there was another. There's another name of something, and I can't remember it offhand, but it's something that I know some of uh, the, the Brits um, are familiar with, uh, and it's a, not hepatitis, it's a blood, it's a blood disorder, but um, no, it was uh, mostly medicinal. Um, it was mostly um, the plague, a plague, not necessarily the black plague, but a plague, so, um, and the historic period. Uh, a lot of, if you did survive, I mean, pre-epidemic populations, and this is based on um, maps and European uh, documentation, uh, more than 90,000 people in this area. And there were approximately 69 villages with between 200 and 2,000 people. And then um, from those villages, they were, they were dispersed. And, um, a large group came down here to the Taunton River area, Upper Cape Cod, and the Merrimack River was also another um, location. Uh, so then John Elliott comes over and working with the tribes establishes 14 praying villages. He, sa he saves the language, but he establishes these 14 praying villages with the tribes, and they select areas that, for whatever reason, are sacred or important to them. And we're working on a site now um, <coughs> in Douglas, Massachusetts, where, and I can't say the longest name, Chibawa Chugawanga, I can't say the name of the lake. 
Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> um, there was a praying village there, and John Elliott um, worked with the tribes, and he uh, taught them um, shingle making, cedar shingle making, and they had this big production uh, in that area. And we've just recently found these very interesting, curious stone features that we do not understand or know what the function of these stone features may be. But there are long uh, waterways associated with this, this area, so I'm really curious to um, get some more information on those. Uh, so, um, and there are descriptions, if you're interested in what the praying villages were like, um, there are descriptions in some of the MAS bulletins that you can find online. Um, and post King Philip's War. Uh, so, during King Philip's War, it was Massachusetts and Nipmuc were rounded up and brought out to Deer Island. Um, they were then dispersed from Deer Island to Great Brewster and to Pettix Island in the dead of winter no supplies, no food, uh, and uh, I'm sure they're, they're buried somewhere out there. We still haven't found the location <coughs> of the burials. Uh, for the ones that uh, survived, um, I have been told that they sold their land for their freedom. Uh, if they wanted to um, become free, they would uh, sell their land. So we have a lot of, and this in the background is a, a map that went up uh, on Sotheby's a few years ago of Spectacle Island in Boston Harbor and it's an Indian deed and it went for $13,500 and it, um, I'll show you the other side, uh, it was owned by four indigenous men and this is 1703. So this isn't that long ago. They own this island and they sold it. Uh, so. Um, my point in bringing this up is there are still a lot of documents out there that have not been found. Um, and it'd be, I mean, this one we found on Sotheby's. Uh, so, um, where do I want to go from? Post King Philip's War, uh, yeah, the prisoners sold land to gain freedom. And um, a lot of these, the remaining surviving were involved in sea trades and, and labor, especially down in this area uh, with the whaling industry. And this is the other side, I'm sorry, it's kind of, but this says Indian deed for Spectacle Island. And these are the four gentlemen with their stamps. <laughs> so they're, you know, documents are great. I, Skinner, I'm sorry, it wasn't Sotheby's. So um, the tribes today have rights. And they have rights that were given to them that were theirs before we became a country. So, um, and they date back to the British and Spanish colonies um, when they were negotiating treaties a long time ago. So, um, again, many ancient statutes control major Indian issues today. Um, we didn't see this here, post-1830 removal to Indian territory reservation system, but we do have, um, DCR manages a couple of reservations, one in actually Freetown. And it's a 34 acre parcel. And I just recently got the documents and they traced it back to the ownership, the legal <coughs> ownership of the land belonging to uh, the Asanit tribe. Uh, yes? Do you know where that piece of land is? Yeah, I was, it's out by Profile Rock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which collapsed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had the state archaeologist, um, Steve, pushed it over. Um, we had the state archaeologist, and I can get the report for you, Stephen Maybe, he's out of UMass Amherst, we had him come and check because we were afraid that there was some tampering or something was being done. Uh, we uh, researched explosives in the area, if anybody was dynamiting, we researched were there any earthquakes, any lightning strikes, nothing, 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 and he hiked the whole thing and he said it was natural. Mm -hmm. well, I thought somebody tried it down. You know, well, that's what I thought originally, because yeah. I went yeah. out there to take a look at it, but it that's why I got the state geologist, the forensic geologist, to come and check it out, because I was worried about that. I was worried about... There's still a bunch of people going out there, even though I know. the gates closed. I know. I mean, I live in a summit, so mm -hmm. that was a big deal for us. Yeah. and. Um, Kenny, we got a, I got a call from Kenny, um, who was the uh, SACOM, and 
uh, concerning artifacts that are out there. So we're we're dealing with that. Um, it would have been it was a sacred place for mm -hmm. the tribes back then, and it is now. Yeah. And you know it's unfortunate. One of the uh, main reasons I jumped from the city of Austin to the state was because I wanted to um, uh, educate, cultivate stewards uh, all over the state, um, not just Boston, and try to make an impact um, on the stewardship of our, our parcels. I can't tell you um, what I see in our state parks. It's horrendous. Uh, you go to any, any other country in the world and there are citizens taking care of their parks. Mm -hmm. um, I got back from China, there were elders on their hands and knees weeding peony guns uh, and you don't see a, a piece of trash, but you go to our parks, you see sofas oh, and, and mattresses, and it's it's so um, you know the first people had it right. The first people were the first stewards. They took care of uh, Mother Earth. They took care of the planet. And I'm just really worried about uh, between humans and natural factors, sea level rise global warming, uh, wind, erosion, um, you know, I'm, I'm particularly worried about the, the coastal and the coastal resources. So, um, let's see, I think, ah, so there are many rights um, from tribal water management, forest management, <coughs> hunting and fishing rights, uh, mineral rights. Uh, and of course, you probably all follow the tribal gaming. Uh, but NAGPRA was the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act that was signed in 1990, and it was a wake-up call uh, for returning and repatriating all of the uh, Native American remains that were located in basements, attics, institutions that had been pilfered, stolen for study, that were sitting at Harvard and sitting at uh, the Peabody and sitting in university basements to be repatriated, returned um, to the tribes. Of the estimated 2.5 million remains across the United States, 57,000 have been repatriated. Oh my God. Yeah. So um, there's a lot we have to do. Um, and, you know, I encourage you, there are so many talks going on this month. There's one tonight at um, Milton Library at 7 p.m. I'm giving a similar talk, Milton Library, Thursday night, but um, they're all over the place. I heard Chief uh, Looking Horse speak at Wellesley College last Monday night. Uh, Tommy Orange was at Lexington Library last Monday night, so I couldn't do both, but if you can, um, try to attend one of the lectures. Uh, they're coming in from all over the world, and um, they're just inspirational um, talks. And they're fighting the good fight, and it's, it's something that we have to um, cultivate with our young people. So just in my lifetime, I've seen so much disappear. But I think, that, I think that's it. So what do you want to do? You want to engage, you want to educate, you want to celebrate. Have any of you been to a powwow? Yeah. Oh, you got to go. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So you have to go to a powwow. Um, the Aquina Cultural Center is down in the vineyard. The Mashpee has a museum. Uh, the uh, Mashantuck and Pequot. Uh, American Indian Museum in Washington, Connecticut. Um, yeah. So this is Kitty Miller. She's the food historian for um, Mashpee. Uh, Wampanoag, and she uh, she comes out and she will actually cook and prepare traditional uh, in one of the traditional pods. And I actually have benefited from it. We did a fish stew, and it's not directly in the pod. It's you can see off to the side, supported by uh, rocks, and it was done in like less than half an hour. It was amazing. Um, and then to see the dancing and the singing, um, I was at the. Uh, a punxit, is that how you say it? In pun, a punxit in born. I want always say punxitani, but it's not punxitani. A punxit. Thank you. Appetuxit. The appetuxit. 
Yeah, so I was down there at the trading post and Wampanoag Day was last month and it was just, it was a wonderful occasion. So, but I think that's it. And so if you have questions, I, I have more artifacts up here, including more uh, weights. I have a soapstone pipe. Um, I have a mortar. I have a fish hook and ulu. So if you want to come up and put the light on. Oh, yeah, with the light on. Thank you. Thank you. But were there any questions? Yes. Do you know anything about the rolling rocks in the Fall River? Oh, yes. Um, wait, is it Standing Rock? Yeah. Standing Rock. Oh, no, I don't. Rolling no. What, what is it? It's, it, 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 it's a huge rock from the uh, glacial period, and it's on the uh, 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 concrete stand. Concrete stand. Okay. This is one of the issues we're looking into now is of uh, what um, some tribes are calling ceremonial stone landscapes, CSLs. I prefer to call them stone landscapes until we can definitively um, go out and survey. So we're working with the tribes on this initiative. The National Park Service is involved, the feds are involved, the tribes are involved, and there are different schools of thought <coughs> on this. I'm a scientist. Um, I know the, the one talk that's being done, given <coughs> November 16th, Saturday, at the MAS is Marty Dudek, and he excavated um, a site in advance of a solar farm going in, and he found a number of these stone structures. And he excavated a few, and in one of them, they found an atlatl weight going back thousands of years. So, um, my point is, um, I, there needs to be a sort of a systematic approach that we can't, I can't assign meaning to something without going through a number of steps, and that certainly includes uh, the tribes, having the tribes participate in it. So um, there are a lot of rocks out there. I, I say to people, well, you know, it's that glacial thing. Um, you see erratics, you see large, large rocks perch. You see profile rock um, collapsing. But um, so more study is needed. And I thought it was a religious thing. I mean, I'm sure they must have used it for a religious thing. Well, maybe, you know, maybe they did. I still, there are certain places I go to and I see my indigenous friends and I know they're using it for spiritual reasons, for spiritual purposes. So, so yeah, um, and I, I, I call the geologist up just to get his take on it. Yes. I, I got to give a comment about Dyke Rock. Yes. Dyke Rock is in my backyard. Is it? I grew up with it, okay? <laughs> they, as, in, as Professor Dalabar, and it started around 1910. Right. Okay. But he found the inscription on the rock 1511. You can find it. If you go out there, you can find the inscription. And he went on the history, as far as the Portuguese are concerned. And there was a navigator that came here. That was, it's written in the logs. He came here with two ships. Right. And... Uh, he was supposed to meet outside of Boston and mm -hmm. go back to Portugal. And the one ship never returned. Right. One ship never returned. And according to Paul, uh, Delabar, that ship, right, is 1511. He has it as that ship that would came up here and documented and kept it there. So he found it in basically that now became one of the instruments that the Portuguese built that tower around the rock and now it is a okay we have a if people want to see it is that every Sunday the first Sunday of the month there is the place is open right okay we usually have a little uh, information so you can take a look at it and it's it still needs help. Oh, it does. Um, but actually, the um, and one of the reasons we had the 3D laser scan was so that we could uh, really investigate on a yeah. small <clears throat> level and make these. We wanted to find out yeah. what which 
carvings were the modern graffiti? Um, were some made with um, a certain instrument? Were they made with metal? Were they made with rock? Were they made with something hard? And we wanted to see if it was more than one person making them. Right. So we were able to, with this scanning um, technology, um, try to get the best relief. And I, I, I know I owe the Friends Group a presentation down there. Um, but they have, um, and I, I give Delabar credit. It's National Register. The only okay. reason it's National Register is because of, because of him. But um, I'm, I'm not convinced that um, it was Portuguese. So. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a good story. Oh, it's a good story. But when you talk about like the Phoenicians, I was like, the, I'm Swedish. I'm like, the Vikings? What were they doing here? The other here? thing, on Grassy Island, yes. like, basically, Grassy Island doesn't exist anymore. Right. Okay, but when he did the excavation, he did find a burial of Indian bones. He so found, he, yes. I have a whole volume on, gra he did an amazing right. job on recording yes. his site. And again, I give him credit. He, he, he bought, purchased the island, he excavated it, he contributed uh, amazing um, data to the archaeological record. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, it is underwater now. Um, but no, I give him credit. I give him a lot of credit. Well, it's global warming. The, the right. river has, you know, according to him, is that in the past, prior to that, it's a, the river has risen at least a foot and a half. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. fascinating. Well, you live in a beautiful spot. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. So the, the end result is. is According to Delabar, there's a lot of historical factors on the Tarp River that's covered by mud because the river has risen over two feet. And so most of the stuff is in this. And you bring up a, a good point. Um, we, the state of Massachusetts, has an underwater archaeologist, and he just moved up from Rhode Island. Um, his name's David Robinson, and he does paleo archaeology. He does submerged paleo sites. So he has worked on the indigenous students uh, who are now attending URI and they're excavating submerged Native American sites. Right. So I have no doubt that there's a lot of stuff uh, right. here in the Taunton River estuary. Absolutely. So um, yeah, with climate change and with the new technologies, they, they are looking at these uh, submerged sites. So it's fascinating. Right. Fascinating. <coughs> Lots of good stuff. Thank you.